Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today you'll be heroes like warriors, healers, scouts, or mages, taking part in a series of adventures leveling up your hero as you play. On the way, you'll encounter monsters, traps, and other challenges. Fighting Fantasy Adventures is a cooperative game based on the books of the same name by Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson, and it's designed by Martin Wallace, who currently has the number one game ranked on Board Game Geek, Brass Birmingham. Now it's for one to four players, for ages 12 and up, although it's still accessible by those that are younger. It takes one to three hours to play, depending on the specific adventure, and is published by Wallace Designs, which is Martin Wallace's publishing company. Now this is on Kickstarter right now, so I'm going to show you how the game works and I'll see you on the other side. This is a Kickstarter preview, so all the art and components you see here are not final. They have been changed quite a bit since this prototype, so you're going to want to check the Kickstarter link in the description of this video to see all the most up-to-date art and components. For example, here's a glimpse at the Kickstarter page with even just these heroes, and as you can see, they're completely different art, background, shading, everything. It looks a lot better in the final product. Now this is a cooperative game, so you're going to be selecting a hero, like a warrior or a scout or a mage or a healer. Now if you play with less than four players, you'll still use four heroes, so you'll just split them up as evenly as possible. Since it's a cooperative game, you'll be running some of them uh, possibly with each other. Uh, or if there's two players, you'd be running two and they'd be running two, for example. Now each of the heroes have some different stats. We have the skill level, we have the stamina, we have luck, and we'll tell you what these mean later. Now each of these heroes comes with their own ability cards and they'll start on level one. And like for example, the warrior comes with a shield, a mighty blow, and improved reactions. Now these are essentially one-time use cards that you'll use at a certain time of the adventure and flip it over. However, you'll notice these are level one and over the course of time and adventures, you'll be able to level up and get more powerful abilities. Now the scout will come with a deadly dagger, but also comes with three improved reactions because you know it's a scout and they're good at reacting. Now the mage will come with some protection, of course, doing some magic, some invisibility, very thematic, and then a couple of fire bolts. Now the healer actually comes with an additional card. Uh, they get two healing hands, some courage, staff block, and rejuvenation. Each adventure is going to have a dungeon deck and an encounter deck. The dungeon deck is going to be different spots in the dungeon we're going to be going through, and the encounter cards are going to be uh, story-driven elements that you'll be reading, sometimes flipping, and different things will happen. Now this is just a sample adventure, so we don't have to worry about spoiling anything with you because it's not planned to be in the campaign at this time. And so you'd flip over the number one encounter card. They're always in order, both the dungeon deck and the encounter card, so you can find them easily. And so, for example, in the encounter card, our quest is to retrieve the Orb of Lucas, and this is kept in a chest that can only be opened by the correct positioning of three special coins. You need to find these coins and the chest. Beware, there are nasty creatures and traps out there. So that's what we're trying to do for this specific adventure. Now, we will start on the number one dungeon card. Uh, this is sort of the prototype for just the, the party token where we are. And you can see different rooms. We have a clicking sound over here in room 16, a sulfur smell in 23, a musty smell in 21. We cooperatively need to decide where to go, but before we do that... Now there's a tactical board, and we're going to be deciding first, second, third, fourth sort of order in a line that the characters are going to be standing, moving, and fighting. Now you'll be able to change that throughout the game, but you know as you're entering in new rooms, you'll need to keep it the way it is until you you know see what's there. Uh, and we'll be putting monsters up here and such. So we'll decide the order. So for example, we'll have the scout, then the warrior, then the mage, and then the healer. So right now we need to decide where to go, and let's say we're going to go to this musty smell number twenty-one. So we've moved into this room, and then you'll take, so we have the, the card number 21, we found it, we put it there right next to it. And of course this is telling us it goes back to card number one. And we see this, and then you would pull the card number of that room and read it. I put it on the table just for now, just to kind of show you it, but usually you would just you know, read that, it wouldn't go on the table. The room's full of broken furniture and ruined clothes, hence the musty smell. Now you may search the room if you wish, if you choose so, then flip the card. So then everyone's gotta decide what to do. Do we flip it and maybe find something useful? Do we flip it and find some sort of creature under there that we didn't see that ends up killing us, <laughs> right? So let's decide to search. We flip this over. You find a net. You decide it may be useful to decide to take it with you. You choose a hero to take this card. And if you decide to use this net for any reasons, then find card 26. So you're gonna say, what's it gonna do? I'm not sure, but when you decide, you then take card 26. So we would give this card to whoever we think should have it. Maybe the scout. 
because they maybe are often going to be first in a room, maybe, maybe. And then, of course, then we could change order if we want to and then move into another room. But in this case, it's sort of a dead end. So we all decide to move back here. Now, again, we could rearrange the order now, but you can't rearrange it right when you get in the room before something happens to you. And I like the scout going first because the scout's good at, you know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> scouting around and they have better reactions and we've given them the net. So now everyone decides, you know what, let's go check out this sulfur smell. The scout will go first. We'll leave everyone, everyone else in the same order and we'll look at card number 23. Okay, so we are moving into this room. We see this here. And hey, if the scout goes first, they will spot the trap and disarm it, right? It was good inclination to think that the scout should have went first now because we didn't know what was going to be there. It worked out in our favor. We were able to disarm it. Any other hero going first will trigger the fire trap, which envelopes them searing flame, and they would take two damage. So it's great. We would have taken two damage, but we didn't because the scout uh, was able to disarm that trap. Now, if we did take damage, it's pretty easy. You just take damage counters. If we had taken two damage, we'd have two, and they would have a stamina of five, seven minus two, for example. If they get to zero, they're unconscious, and they're not dead. You can still sometimes drag them out of a room and heal them and things like that. Uh, but that's basically how damage works. So it said, flip the dungeon card. You'll notice three dragon images on the wall. You can investigate them further if you wish by flipping this card. Okay, do we, do we think it's another trap or do we want to look at that? This is what we decide to do. If not, we go back to room one or we go into room 10. We don't have a whole lot of information on what might be coming from room 10, but these are the types of decisions that you'll be making cooperatively together. We decide to check it out. So we flip the card, you scratch at the images and remove flakes of paint. You discover nothing special about them. They are what they are. See, sometimes they're just little red herrings. Sometimes they're bad things. Some things are good things. This is why you need to decide together as a group what to do. And so maybe we just decide, hey, let's go to this room 10. We don't know what's in there, but uh, and let's keep our order the same. All right, so we've moved into room 10, and I've just flipped this card for us. A chest with a key, an inscription on it reads, whoever can open me owns me. If you wish to open the chest, then choose a hero to make an attempt and then flip this card. If we don't want to, we can go back to room 10. We can go to room 13, room 11, room 9, which has a digging sound. But let's see what would happen here if we tried to uh, open the chest. So I think we should go for it. And again, it doesn't seem super dangerous. It doesn't seem like we might need magic. It doesn't seem like the healer might be a good idea. So let's just stick with the scout and say, let's have the scout do it. So we flip this over and the card says, if the scout attempts to open the chest, they will succeed. Find card 31. If any other hero tries to uh, tries the chest, it remains locked and no further attempts can be made. So great, we get uh, card number 31. Inside the chest is a cloak and a small scroll. The scroll informs you that the cloak is magic and will render the wearer invisible for a small period of time, so choose carefully when you wish to wear it. It also tells you to hand wash only with soap flakes. Only the scout can use this cloak. When they choose to do so, flip this card. Cloak of invisibility. That's great. So we have this thing. We know it's going to last not a lot of time, but we don't know exactly how long or if there's any other benefits other than just invisibility. So we've got to decide when to use it the right time and then flip it over and see what may happen. So let's say we move up to the digging sound of number nine. We'll go to card nine that says, there's two giant cockroaches. If you decide to defeat them, you can search the room by flipping this card. Now we've got two cockroaches, A and B, and they have a, a skill of seven and a stamina of seven, both of them. Now we look at the tactical board. We have the two cockroaches here. This was the order that we entered the room. Now, if there's a fight here, the person that was first has to fight. That's one of the reasons why you gotta decide who's doing what before you go into a room. But let's say so this one's gonna be first fighting this monster, this one's gonna be fighting this monster, for example. These two are not fighting anything right now. So let's just go through a basic round of combat to show you how it works. Now this normally would be over in the dungeon, but I brought it close to kind of simulate the battle a little easier for you. Now the scout down here is fighting this, remember it goes in this order like this. So normally what's gonna happen is we're gonna roll two dice for each, the monster and the hero. However, if you remember this scout, we had gotten a net earlier. It says if you wanna use it, use look at card 26. Great, let's use it, right? So we bring out this net and it says, if you use it in regular combat, you can target uh, the enemy, they'll suffer minus two to their skill for one round of combat. Or I could use it as a rope if it were any help. So, hmm, we're using it in combat. Maybe we should have saved this for a rope to go down somewhere a little later. Oh, well. Well, let's show you how it works anyway. So we've rolled the dice, and we add our dice. So 7 plus our skill. We're at 7 here, so 14 total. They're at 6 plus 7. Normally, they'd be at a 13, but they got a minus 2 to their skill for this one round of combat. So instead of being at 13, you minus that by 2. They're at 11. So we have 14. They have 11. The difference is 3. We beat them by 3. 
And so we place a little minus three stamina here. They had seven, they're minus three, they're at four. If we ever get them to zero, that one is defeated. So let's say now I roll for the warrior versus this bee cockroach here. They have eight rolled plus their nine, so that's 17. And this has a, a skill of seven plus three, which is 10. So that's seven damage done, because we had seven more of them, but they only have seven stamina. So this cockroach is dead. So we just pull this one off like this. And these two are not doing anything. This is the way we came in the room. That's the way it, you know, it was right now. And so now we're going to go through another round of combat because there's still a monster left. So now we can decide what to do with these other heroes. Do we want them to stay out of it because maybe they're hurting and we don't want them to get hurt? Or you can gang up, right? So maybe we go like this, so we have everyone gang up on this thing. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna do another round of combat. This one, these two are gonna roll. And if he's still alive, then this one's gonna roll against it, but it's gonna get a plus one. Then this one's gonna get a plus two. And this one's gonna get a plus three because we're all ganging up on this. So you'd roll for each of these, roll, 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 roll. And keep, keep you know, uh, resolving that until uh, most likely this monster's gonna be dead or until all of us are unconscious, essentially. If someone does get to zero, they're unconscious. They can't, you know, you got to drag them out of a room and stuff. But um, that's pretty much how the basic combat works. So we were able to uh, search this card and we found a rope with a hook on the end of it. And you decide it may be worth taking it with you. If you ever choose to use it, then find card 30. So we're going to be finding, well, good thing, because we used that net to help us. It could have been used for a rope. I thought we had lost an ability to maybe get down to a, you know, a place down below. But we found the rope. So maybe we, it was okay. Now remember that you can use any of the available sort of ability cards for different heroes. They're one-time use, but now that you've seen a little bit of the game, let's go through some of these a little bit more detail. Like for example, the scout, you could have used improved reactions. After rolling your dice, you could add two to the total. It can be used in all situations. So like tests, traps, things like that. You cannot use this card to help another player. The warrior could have used a shield and it could have been used in combat after dice are rolled. You could ignore all the damage inflicted on you in one round of combat. And you cannot use this card against, uh, you know, to protect from traps. The healer could have used Courage, maybe. And you play that card before the dice are rolled in combat, choose another hero, and they gain plus two skill for the entire combat situation, helping other people out, but you can't use it on yourself. Or maybe the mage uses a Firebolt. Uh, use it in combat before the dice are rolled, and you can flick three damage on your, on your target. And this counts as you resolving one round of combat, if you wish. So you can choose not to roll dice for combat. However, you can still do so if you wish. So as you can see, and again, each of these have multiple cards, right? This is just one of each of them to show you, now that you understand how combat works and things, different ways that you would use these. They're one-time use, you'd flip them down. But again, remember, throughout Adventures, you're going to be able to level these up to more powerful versions of these. Now, I do want to show you one other aspect of combat. Let's say we've gone to this room. It was right next to the where we found the cloak in that chest. We decided to come back and go this way. We see this big knight here. Great skill. 11. Lots of good stamina as well. Now, let's say the warrior is going to be the one that's uh, fighting him right now, right? And let's say we roll the dice. Wow. So we roll these dice. This one's at 11 plus 11 skill. They're at 22. We're at 9 plus 3. We're at 12. They are going to do 10 damage to us, which would absolutely destroy us. We'd go unconscious. But... I haven't told you about luck yet. We have seven luck. I'm going to go ahead and use one luck, so I only have six left. But I get to re-roll all of the dice. Both the monsters die, uh, the creature, and us. So, all right, well, that one's a little bit better, right? So you have as much luck, but again, once you're out of luck, you're out of luck. In this case, it's tied 17 to 17, but maybe we now rearrange and everybody gangs up on them and we start making some headway. So luck is an important part of the game that you can manipulate, but there's only so much you can press it. Now, so we've made our way through a bunch of rooms, some different things, some big rocks, and we've gotten through here. And now we're at this little pit here, and a large pit with spikes at the bottom that bars your way. The gap's too big to jump. Discuss the possible solutions, then flip the card. Well, if you remember, we used the net that we thought we could use as a rope, but then we found a rope as we searched what we beat. So let's say, yeah, well, we've got a rope. Let's flip this card. Maybe we can use the rope to get across, right? So you flip this card. And the following solutions will light across and recross the room. Use a rope. You cannot use it again. So we have now used our rope and we're out. Uh, we could have used planks, maybe. We could have used a net as a rope, which we had seen earlier. You could have tied some claws. So all these different things you may have found throughout, throughout it. But if you came up with one of the above, then you can, uh, that each hero gains a luck. We just talked about luck. Here's a way to get some back, which would be great. If not, then all heroes lose two luck. Oof. So if we thought we had the right solution and we didn't, we would have lost two luck. If you could do uh, one of the above, then continue with your adventure. Otherwise, it ends here. Ooh, baby. Good thing we had that rope. 
And let's just show you one more thing. Let's say we got through that. We got through another monster. We get here. There is a large jar with various colored plungers on it. Red, gold, violet, yellow, silver, blue, and green. And the script reads, your desire can be found at the end of the rainbow. Do you wish to press a plunger? And if so, which one? Well, which one is at the end of the rainbow? I think it's violet, right? So we flip this up. If you press the violet plunger, then the jar cracks open and reveal a red coin. If you press any other plunger, then it explodes, inflicting two damage on you. You can take, uh, you can still take the coin. If the damage takes you to zero, stamina, then the adventure ends here. So there we go. So different puzzles and things like that. But I think you have a good idea of how things work, how combat works, how moving works, how ganging up works, some luck, some traps, some different uh, puzzle items, and different things to, you know, choose your own adventure style types of things in a cooperative way. Check out the Kickstarter link to learn more. Well, there you have Fighting Fantasy Adventure. And as I showed in the overview, you're cooperatively deciding where to explore, what order to explore and fight in, and being immersed in story-driven encounters. Now, if you'd like to see the most up-to-date components and the pledge levels and all the different things that's on the Kickstarter page, you can click the link below me in the description of this video. Now, that's going to take you directly to that project page, and I'm sure that Wallace Designs would love your support.